Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second panel on forest-dependent livelihoods, climate change impacts, and adaptations. This panel will be moderated by Dr. Eva Guerin. She's the program director for LT, the Environmental Leadership and Training Initiative at the Yale School of the Environment. So I'll hand it off to Eva to introduce our panelists. Wonderful. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah? I think it's on now. Yeah? Yes. OK, great. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to see everyone here today. And I know we're joined by a lot of people online. I can't see you all, but it's wonderful to have you here. Um, so this is the panel two of the conference on forest dependent livelihoods, climate change impacts, and adaptations. So I'm really excited for this uh, panel. I think we've heard in the other sessions, there's been so much discussion about the social aspects, sociocultural aspects of, of tropical forests and um, people living in those forests, depending on those forests. And so this is a really wonderful panel to be able to highlight that. And so I have the great honor of moderating the panel. And we have three amazing guests here with us today. So I'm going to introduce them. Um, once I'm finished with the introductions, we're going to invite each one up to give a presentation. And so the presentations are going to be about 10 minutes. And then directly after each presentation, you all are going to have the opportunity to ask a few questions. Um, so we'll do questions from the audience, questions from um, folks online. And uh, after that, we will finish up the presentations, and then we'll go into a general discussion. So we'll take more questions from the audience, and then we'll have a moderated panel discussion. So um, a lot to do. We want it to be really interactive. These are meaty, interesting um, topics, so lots to discuss. Okay, so without further delay, I want to introduce um, Andrea Acevedo. Dr. Andrea Acevedo has created and coordinated several projects in most states of the Brazilian Amazon for the last 15 years, publishing more than 30 technical and scientific studies with articles highlighted in science and PNAS journals. She has broad experience in the analysis of public environmental policies regarding deforestation, working with multi-stakeholder groups alongside the private sector. Currently, she's executive director of the JBS Fund um, for the Amazon, and that supports socio-environmental projects in the Amazon region. Dr. Acevedo has a degree in biological sciences, a master's degree in economics, as well as a PhD in sustainable development from the University of Brasilia, in addition to an executive MBA degree. So she's a board member of both Conservation International in Brazil and um, the Amazon Concertation. Okay, so then our second panelist is uh, Dr. Agni, or Intu. I, you go by both, so I know you as Intu. Um, Boidi Hartono. Uh, Dr. Boidi Hartono is an associate professor of tropical landscapes and livelihoods at the University of British Columbia. She has worked with multidisciplinary teams in remote locations in tropical landscapes and seascapes in Asia, Africa, and in Latin America. She's focused on issues with indigenous peoples and local communities, particularly on the importance of their traditional knowledge and wise practices in natural resources management and the conservation of their cultural diversity. Dr. Boidi Hartono, um, her research has sought to enable forest-dependent people, coastal communities, and indigenous groups to achieve a balance between conservation and social, cultural, and economic development. Um, she has a doctorate in ethnology and visual anthropology from the University of Paris 7 and has worked for organizations including the International Union for Conservation of Science, the United Nations Environment Program, and the Center for International Forestry Research. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Brendan Fraser, or excuse me, yeah, Dr. Brendan Fraser. Um, he's the director of the Environment Program, a professor in the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources, and a fellow of the Gund Institute for Environment at the University of Vermont. His research and field work lie at the nexus of conservation, development, natural resource economics, and human behavior. He's the author of close to 100 peer-reviewed articles and two books, Valuing Ecosystem Services and a Field Guide to Economics for Conservationists. In 2013, he was a Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Fellow and from 2001 to 2002, he was a Fulbright Fellow working in Spain on socio-ecological systems in the Spanish Pyrenees. Dr. Fraser has a, a doctorate in natural resources from the University of Vermont and a master's in science in environmental change and management from Oxford University. 
So it's a great honor to welcome you all um, to this panel, and we will jump right in. So we'd like to start with you. Come. Welcome. Please join me in welcoming. Thanks, Ava, and thanks, everyone, for being here. And I just want to add my thanks to, to Angela and Chamri and Emma and Charlie and Leah and everybody else um, who put this, this conference on. Just before I left the University of Vermont on Wednesday, I had a meeting with my grad students telling them they should be going to student-run conferences. Mm -hmm. The student-run conferences always have amazing energy, low ego, and a lot of fun. And also, I find them to be a lot more optimistic about our future. So thank you. So a quick introduction to, um, to my research and what I do is basically just how the functioning of, functioning of the human use of and the management of this kind of like big, muddy earth ball affect things like biodiversity, human health and welfare, and also how they integrate with cost. So everything we do has a cost in some way. And I don't mean just financial cost, although we do look at the financial cost of interventions or conservation, but also cost to human health, cost to human happiness and utility, um, as evidenced by the two characters there dancing, which apparently there are some several studies that show that dancing is probably the best thing you can do to increase your mood, your affect, and your overall happiness. So one of the student conferences that I like to go to a lot, they end with a big dance party. And so it, that might be a suggestion <laughs> for next year. Um, my research, I've been very lucky to be part of projects that take place in a lot of tropical forests. So in Colombia and Tanzania and Mozambique um, and, in, <clears throat> and in Borneo, but also in China and that green blob in North America, which is actually covering New Haven as well, is just in the sugar maple forest of my home state in Vermont, just north of here. I'm just going to briefly go over a few specific lessons, which are actually kind of general lessons from this suite of research I've been lucky enough to be involved in. Um, and they're, they may seem banal, but I'll give some examples. So we all know that well-functioning forests support livelihoods. Hundreds of millions of people rely on their local forests for livelihoods. <clears throat> I'm gonna give one example. And this is from some work in Tanzania. Actually, this project was also included, for those of you who heard our panel yesterday, um, yesterday morning, Simon Lewis, who talked about the uh, peat swamps in the Congo was a big part of this project as well. So the eastern arcs of Tanzania um, are one of the hottest hot spots in the world, meaning they have super high levels of endemism and um, high levels of conversion over the last 50 years or so. About 45% of the people are food insecure on a daily basis and live below the World Bank poverty line. So an area um, that critically needs to utilize its resources for, uh, for agriculture, for fuel and charcoal. And one of the key things from these forests, both Miombo Woodlands and the Montane Forest, uh, are about 13% of households in this 1,000-kilometer chain of mountains rely on income from non-timber forest products and income from the forest as their sole or their main source of income. Uh, NTFPs, um, non-timber forest products for both cash and non-cash exchanges accounts for about 20% 20 20 of the total household income. And poorer households are more reliant on their forests. So the bottom two circles, this was animated, so apologies for the confusion here, but the bottom two, left and right, look at the percentage of households collecting firewood, making charcoal, using poles and thatch. And just the firewood alone, you can see 95% of the households in the poorest quartile and just about the same in the richest quartile. But if we move up, you can see that the percent of non-timber forest um, products to total income for the poorest households is about a quarter of their total income, where much less for the richest households. And again, 
these aren't rich households. The, um, that mean NTFP income uh, is about $200 purchasing power parity for the richest group, so still very um, marginalized households. So everyone needs forests, the poor need it most. Well-functioning forests uh, support um, and improve health outcomes. This is, uh, I'm gonna just show a few results and happy to send papers and I do have the, the, the um, citations in the next slide. But this is work from a long-term project that started out as a, as a synthesis group where we had MDs and public health experts, ecologists, economists, anthropologists, hydrologists, demographers, all in a room, and also implementing agencies, funders, academics, et cetera. And the goal was to try to utilize existing data sets, bring them all together and synthesize them to ask questions about the relationship between our treatment and our management of ecosystems and human health. And so we created this database with almost a thousand observations, I'm sorry, a thousand, a million children observations of children in the world across about 400 columns of data, biophysical data such as distance to protected areas, tree cover, distance to roads, climate, all kinds of climate data, socioeconomic characteristics, so wealth, gender of household head, time to drinking water, and then health outcomes. These health outcomes come from the um, USAID's demographic and health surveys and um, things like these are real biometric um, engagement with the survey population. So finger pricking people to look at hemoglobin levels, measuring children to measure stunting and wasting, et cetera. So malaria, diarrheal disease, and nutrition. Mm -hmm. Spatial coverage, again, this, the bulk of the data came from the USAID demographic and health survey, so much focused on what we used to call the least developed countries, and we worked a lot on the database in Africa. And it kind of looks like this. So for Mozambique, for one survey, there's about 3,000 households. We know um, which households have children who had diarrhea in the last two weeks. We know which of those households have unimproved water sources, so use surface water or untreated well water. And then we know the human activity upstream from that house, so human activity and livestock density as well. And Thank goodness, because this database, which we told the funder would take us six months to build, took us four years. And we had four amazing postdocs working on it over the last, I guess, almost 10 years now. And they are the ones that wrangled the data and did all the hard work. And with that database, we're able to ask questions about how forest, forest um, quality and forest extent upstream affects dietary diversity downstream, and there's a whole bunch of mechanisms that that um, relationship trails through. We can ask questions about how forests affect rural versus urban households with respect to health outcomes. Mm -hmm. So we hope not to see in very urban areas an effect of a forest that's quite far away on health outcomes. We can ask about specific dietary um, needs and outcomes. So we can ask about the vitamin A intake and iron intake. We can see how deforestation affects your probability that you um, will test positive for malaria and how that might interact or not interact with bed net use. And then we can also look at the kind of wealth disaggregation for things like diarrhea, severe stunting, severe anemia. And diarrheal disease is the number two reason for mortality in children under five globally. And so any kind of intervention we can do to try to slow something like that down and trying to understand the roles that forests play in regulating water quantity and quality to diminish the effect of um, diarrheal disease is kind of one of our goals. And so some of the findings we see that, um, that protecting forest in watersheds and upstream of households in our data set um, could be a key human health intervention. And we compare it against other human health interventions in a few of these papers. But the general trends are it's reduced diarrhea, but mainly for rural households. Increased dietary diversity, mostly for poorer households. Reduced stunting only for the poorest households and reduce malaria, more so in poorer households. So not only are we all reliant on forest in one way or another, but it's the, those who most need it are the most reliant. Sorry, that was circular. Um, mm -hmm. the, we see the biggest impact on those that are most in need. So 
Yadvinder started a little bit of a controversy yesterday with his logging is good um, arc, but I know he clearly said in the beginning was that this is a defense of logging. So um, we worked for a long time in the same areas that Yadvinder worked in and found very similar outcomes in that logged forest, and the way we pitch it is that logged forests actually have retain a ton of value in it for biodiversity. And it's not that log, you should go log a forest, but log forests are real um, cost-effective opportunities for conservation because the opportunity cost for conserving them is low because a lot of the timber values have been removed. And so we found incredibly high levels of biodiversity in these log forests in, in Borneo. And then also, I, don't, I just want to have a quick line to say that the spiritual and cultural meanings, and I think we'll hear more about that, of these forested landscapes are really important um, for tropical forest community identities. And we're seeing that a lot. We're doing work in the Andes right now in Colombia and looking at cloud forest and paramount <laughs> ecosystems. And in addition to all of the um, ecosystem services provided by these functioning forests, what we're seeing a lot of is the identity connected to these forests, the spirituality, the religious, and the um, kind of the emotive connection to forests. I think, okay, I'll just cheat one more minute <laughs> and just say, uh, I think about this a lot. This is a book that was put out in 2007 by Atul Gawande, and he, he ends this book called Better with our greatest public, um, global public health interventions and improvements are going to come not from breakthrough genetic technologies and not through high tech this and that, but actually just doing the things that we already know work better. And I think about that a lot in conservation and with forests, and I'm learning a lot of that here with you all this week, is that there's so many things that we know to do, work with women groups um, and franchise communities, et cetera. We just need to figure out how to do it better. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fisher. Do we have any questions from the audience that you'd like to ask? It's like my 8.30 class. <laughs> and I don't know how to check online here. I don't know if anybody knows how to check there, but I'll see what we can do. Okay. Um, oh, should I sit down? Okay. Oh, I have a question. Yeah. I, okay? I'm mic'd, so I can still answer. Oh, okay, great. Um, I was thinking about that slide where um, you mentioned the protection of forests um, has significant health benefits in different ways, and I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to like the conservation restoration dimension, um, mm -hmm. protection and restoration, and whether it's just as simple as, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that eventually becomes conservation. That's a really great question, and I think um, so. In all of our models and data analysis, we use like a we use a space for time approach, and so we don't have um, uh, time series data in the same spots for the same people. And I think that's what you would need to test to see if, like, as we're regrowing forest in this watershed. Um, but I think that is absolutely a fundamental question to ask, is that can we improve these human health um, outcomes downstream through reforestation? And I don't know the answer to it, but I think that's a, that's a really good question. Great. Yeah. Great talk. Thank you so much. Let's see if I can ask the question. So with the log forest reducing the opportunity costs, it's, uh, of course, uh, one mechanism, right, that you can um, reduce the incentives for um, clearing that forest, even though they're roads, and it's much easier to do so. And then it goes contrary to the idea that you have to incorporate some of the natural capital, right, that it is in those high primary biomass forests or a high biodiversity. And the natural capital it seems that did not incorporate or percolate it into the conservation uh, kind of big initiatives that are ongoing. Do you have some thoughts on why this did not happen? Um, I don't. I don't. So we worked for a long time on this Heart of Borneo project, and um, that was one of the ideas is once you start evaluating the natural capital and all of the benefits that stem from you know, primary forest uh, 
they should really counteract the um, impetus to convert those. But um, I think you know there's the, there's the difference between the calculus on paper and the and the science, and then getting inside some boardroom or in some side some kind of um, 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 city discussion or urban discussion or company discussion when all of a sudden maybe that other natural capital accounting that isn't um, easily able to be monetized and put in somebody's pocket starts to change the calculus once the doors close. So mm -hmm. I don't know. That's kind of my cynical approach to it. But I think from Pablo's uh, talk today, I'm, I'm optimistic that, you know, these partnerships are now starting to have more open doors. But I, I will just say that, um, you know, with, with Yetvinder's data and the data that we, we um, produced, you know, these logged forests, they really can. There's a lot of them out there in the tropics, and they, they provide with um, unique opportunities to expand existing protected area networks, um, to create buffers and corridors because they're logged, but they do have high values, and for a long time they've been, they've been overlooked. Great. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the next. Well, Another. we also have oh. one online question. One online. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so it says, where or how can we find the balance between access to forests to support livelihoods while um, ensuring sustainable usage of forest resources? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, <laughs> and definitely outside my expertise. And I think there's a lot of experts uh, here at the conference and. Um, I think Dr. Juliet and, and Pablo this morning um, kind of uh, spoke to that a bit in terms of incorporating voices, the um, keeping an eye on the gender dimensions of it, thinking about partnerships both far and wide and and local partnerships as well. So I yeah. think it kind of takes a takes a, a big team to make sure that there is access for daily needs, but also there's a much longer time horizon thinking about the future of the forest in, say, 10, 25 years. Okay. And we can come back to that, too, at the, at the end of the panel session. I think we're waiting yeah. Yeah. for a slide. the slides. Okay. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, so we're going to change the order. Um, and so, Andrea, you're going to go next. <laughs> Andrea, sorry. Um, and then we'll move on to the next one after. Okay? Great. My time. Okay, wonderful. Hi, everyone. Oh, sorry. Is that on? Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? No? Oh. Hi, everyone. Yes. Huh? I think so. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for the Yale School, Environmental Yale School, for the invitation, especially the organizers. I am pleased to be here with you today. And as Eva told you, I am from Brazil. I've been working with, in the Amazon region for quite some time with Paulo Brando. <laughs> and uh, today, I hope to talk a little bit about the context of Brazilian Amazon, especially Brazilian Amazon. Um, try to, to draw the, this interconnectedness between deforestation, climate change, and uh, the livelihoods. And also, if we have time, talk about some solutions and what the fund where I currently work uh, is doing. Okay? So, one thing that to start is very important. We, with the time, I've learned that we don't have most of the answers <laughs> of what to do. Maybe we are much better in offering, di offering diagnosis and scenarios, but 
to do the, the real thing in the field, it's very hard. So uh, most of the things I will present to you in terms of solutions are still being tested, are still pilots, but we need to get scale in most of these solutions. Uh, and talk about deforestation also, it's go much further than end deforestation. I've learned with these years that talk about how to end of deforestation is talk about education, is talk about culture, is talk about economy, is talk about sanitation, health. So it's not so quite simple. Go there, do enforcement, everything is nice. So it's not. So some lessons that I've been learning, not as scientists, but as scientists as well, but uh, as I would say, a, a, a person that really wants to collaborate to solve the solution, as I think all of you are here today to do. So uh, to start here, let's see. Okay, only to, to show you the region, uh, it's a very broad view of the Pan-Amazonia Pan that encompasses nine, nine countries, countries mm -hmm. in the South America and measures around seven million square kilometers. It's huge. It represents almost half of South America's size and about 50% of all tropical forests in the world. Uh, talking about Brazilian, uh, we also, Brazilian uh, Amazon also encompasses four states, uh, nine states, and it represents around 60% of the size of Brazilian. Uh, we have living there, within these states, we have around 28 million uh, people, and it represents around 10% of total inhabitants of Brazil. But the GDP is only 9% of Brazil. Mm -hmm. And Amazon is the major or the biggest emit Amazon, I mean legal Amazon, is the biggest emit emitter uh, of uh, green gas house of Brazil. Mm -hmm. Of course, that is because the deforestation. So we have, although Amazon is very different, quite different. It's not the same. It's not that pristine area with a lot of forests. No, it's not. We have some common challenges. And one of these is, uh, in one of these challenges I divide in three parts, is deforestation. Regarding, we have seven, 17 to nine, it depends on the source, but it goes from 17 to 20% of all Amazon defore deforested. Also, um, we have 47 people of people living in poverty, and the worst social indicators are in the north of Brazil, mm -hmm. in this region, northwest and north. But in despite uh, that Amazon represents one third of the world's tropical forest, we, we, it has a tiny share of the global market for such products, non-timber non forest uh, products. That is less than 0.2% of a market that generates worldwide revenues of, of, order, of over one, 170 billion dollars a year. So. I don't know if you have seen a, a, a paper from Salo Kolovsk from New York University. Uh, he, he did all this analysis about this uh, export, pro, forest product related export that were exported. And you know what? We are the biggest producers of Brazilian nuts or Parano nuts. But the biggest exporter is Bolivia. We, we sell to Bolivia and they export to Europe. Why that? We have a lot of problems that could be uh, 
be better. So, the, so this division is, uh, has been doing for some scientists, some people, a group of scientists uh, of, call it Amazon 2030, okay? And, but most, most people are talking about their, their, the, these divisions. And we have at least five Amazons, at least. It is based more in the remaining uh, vegetation that is covering each region. So in green, the forested Amazon represents 39% of the Brazilian Amazon. It's the most conserved at, at all, of all categories. There we have the indigenous land, we have all kinds of protected areas, and also a lot of non-designated areas are, are here. And uh, in, in yellow, we have these forests under pressure, so we have, we still have a lot of vegetation there, but they are under pressure. It's what we call arc of deforestation. And you see in the Amazon, in the south of the estado, state of Amazonas, that is big state, how deforestation is growing fast. Uh, so these, these, this, this forest under pressure, re oops, represents, sorry, around uh, 20, 29%. And also in red, we have this already uh, converted re uh, region. Already almost everything was converted. And here we have agriculture and cattle, mostly. That it is inside what we call agribusiness, the industry. And it is very important for the economy of Brazil. It's, it's true. So we have to have actions here to make this better, as traceability, as intensification, and other kind of measures. Uh, and the, the gray part is known for as Amazon, we call Cerrado or Savannah, and the spots in black is the urban Amazon. We have big cities, by the way, and 75% of the people that live there are in the cities. So, and we have the same problems as the biggest cities. So, this a little bit, why I am uh, talking about this? Because the solutions, the public policies, and the opportunities, economic opportunities, are quite different depending on what we are trying to do or, or trying to address. For example, in the green area, we need to uh, boost bioeconomy the commercialization of non-timber uh, pro forest products. But in, in red and maybe in the yellow, we need to, intensif to promote intensification to smallholders, for example, to give another opportunity because only um, enforcement doesn't solve to smallholders. They will not change if they don't have opportunity. So I think that it's, it's very, it's, very useful to understand the difference that we have too. This slide is only to, to show you that these parts in, in white, you know, are non-designated or non-allocated areas. And it is almost 60 million hectares. That's uh, uh, equivalent to the territories of Spain and Portugal together. 30% of deforestation each year is happening on these areas. So it's something that we need to uh, tackle to, to overcome this problem. Uh, this slide is very useful to understand also that in green are the protected areas and in rose, it's like lighter ro rose, the private areas and in the dark rose, the settlements. We have almost 35 million hectares of settlements with smallholders farm in the Amazon. Uh, and this slide is only, it's very fast. It's to show the, Paulo Brando knows a lot, 
uh, the river, shingle river basin, so it's in Mato Grosso and Pará. In yellow, we have uh, indigenous land, and see when I insert the forestation. So it's very important, indigenous land, to secure deforestation. Is the most important category that is securing deforestation. Is the smallest, defor the smallest de deforestation among all categories uh, of, is the indigenous land. Are the indigenous land, sorry. Uh, here's only to show you the rhythm of deforestation through the years. And as you can see the graph, the effectiveness of forest protection policies has changed over the last 20 years. Uh, it used to have a public plan con to control deforestation in, in the legal Amazon that was launched in 2004. We succeed in declining deforestation to 70 to 8 percent in this period, 2012 and 14. And uh, it started growing again since 2015, and in the last four years, it has increased even more. You know that, I am sure, around 50% when we compare with the previous period. So it's a little shocking, but it's the truth. We, truth. We, we hope that with the, this new government, we can change. But. It's impressive to see how, how we <laughs> deforestation change as government change. Mm -hmm. This slide shows this interconnectedness between deforestation and climate change and the effects of deforestation and climate change. The, the main aspect at the end uh, are reduction in productivity of forests. Now, these, re, these productivity productivity reduces and in, the, in decreased diversity of species, as well change in the geographical distribution. Uh, you can see in this map, it's a research from Brandon that is some counties, uh, the colors are of counties, are the deforestation can explain up to 38% of the decrease in commercialization of non-timber uh, forest products. So deforestation is not the only cause. We are losing people to illegal min mining, illegal grabbing, but is one of the most important causes of this decreasing. And of course that this, this fact will deliver uh, lower income, decrease of in income, and also displacement of some, some communities. Uh, and I don't know if you are aware to see, if you, if you see this in the last days, the case of Yanomam indigenous land. So it's not linked with climate change at all, but it's a case of uh, displacement of people and indigenous going to work with illegal mining also some and illegal grabbing in some other places. So uh, I think that my time is almost there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll, I will, uh, this is my, my end. Uh, I'd like to offer to you to think three main solutions to overcome most of these social impacts. First, of course, is how deforestation with a lot of enforcement and designating these areas that are public right now. With traceability coming from private sector, this is very, very important. And uh, alternatives to intensification of production. Only to, to, have, to have an idea, um, the, the settlements respond to more or less 25 to 30 percent of deforestation every year. And even when it decreased a lot, the relative numbers are the same. Mm -hmm. So enforcement to smallholders doesn't, doesn't solve the problem. 
boost the reforestation. We have really, really to bet on reforestation. I personally think that agroforestry is the, to your happiness, Eva, <laughs> is, a, is the best option because we need to have some income from, coming from this uh, productive restoration. Of course, we need ecological recovery. Of course, we need ecological reco uh, restoration and forestry as well. Mm -hmm. But we need to improve the genetic of the na native species, species to be more economic, economically attractive. And uh, strengthen, we need to be absolutely um, ambitious to strengthen bioeconomy because it, is, it has a great potential in Brazil with all that biodiversity that we have. And for that, we need to support the community uh, business as well. A lot with technical assistance mainly and access to finance and market. So one of the examples that I can comment uh, after my talk is that we are uh, designing and implementing some blended finance to, to de-risk the investment of private on this kind of business, uh, in this kind of, kind of business. And also uh, science and technology, it is very important. Why science and technology is important? Mainly research and development. To find new ingredients, new vegetable proteins, and other kind of ingredients to the industry and to add value to community business. Mm -hmm. Indigenous land, most of them, they have in their business. They, they commercialize a lot of their products. And yeah, I think it's that. Thank you very much, Thank and I, I can comment the, the examples that I, I brought in the, the discussion. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll take just one burning question from the audience, and then we'll move on, and then we can have questions again at the end. Yes. Because also I may think that agroforestry has been a difficult uptake for agroforestry because of the lack of finances, markets, technical assistance. And so I'm wondering why is that the strength in the bioeconomy also is not thought as a strategy to support agroforestry and forestry? And comes as an independent they, bucket. No, they are no, they are linked. We are right. It, it, they they have this this link, uh, the bioeconomy and bioeconomy. It's a, it's a concept in discussion, I would say. So it's uh, very controversial. But uh, agroforest, yeah, we need all this, and we don't have a model to scale yet. We are trying to pilot things, so we don't have the answer for how to get so such a scale that a lot of people are saying, I don't know if you know Carlos Nobre, I, I, you might know, he's talking about arc of restoration, a lot of restoration, uh, areas with restoration. It's nice, I think that it's, it's a good idea, but we have to prove economically these, these models. The main problem of agroforest for me, in my point of view, is commercialization of the products because we have a lot of products coming from that. And for example, we are trying with cocoa because we have demand to cocoa, for cocoa. Uh, but other like manioc or banana or others, to, to be rich, might be have a lot of species. We don't have. So we have to build business around these agroforests. But they are linked, you are right. Okay, why don't we go ahead and move on so we can get through the presentations and then we can have a really rich discussion after that as well. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, I think there was a little 
technical thing because my my presentation is there's a animation on it, so that's why I wanted it to be the right PowerPoint because before they were putting a PDF. Because um, yeah, maybe you were wondering what is a visual anthropology, uh, you know, these things. Because so I'm a visual anthropologist, so my background is actually in art and. Um, I did natural sciences, but I also do um, cinematography and anthropology. So basically, visual anthropology is a, it's a, the use of different visual techniques. It could be painting, drawing, uh, music, everything that has to do with um, uh, visual, any kind of different visual techniques. So you'll see why it is important in my presentation here. So um, <laughs> since yesterday, when I was listening to everybody else's presentation, so I sort of uh, changed all the time my, my PowerPoint because I thought it, it's more interesting to be more interactive with everyone. And my student always asked me about um, how do you get really interesting and passionate work in your, in your life, right? And, and uh, since that I, I, I'm really passionate about art and culture, so that's why I mix everything in my work because I, I'm really into um, conservation uh, because I work with IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature, but I also used to work with C4, Center for International Forestry Research, but I see myself as a practitioner and an artist. So, so this is about uh, why do I get into this um, work in the, um, in the first place. So uh, I'm gonna talk about two different sites where we work for, um, with a lot of different partners. It's our long-term engagement in these different landscapes. So one is in Indonesia and one is in the Congo Basin. Does it work? Hmm. Yes. So, so when, when I first started, uh, oh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, there were a lot of people on the ground uh, working in conservation. Yeah, and, and, and the triangle is like that. And so it's only a few people up in the, I don't know, Washington, D.C. or Geneva. <laughs> so, uh, but then when I, I start going to all these different international conferences uh, in the Cop Copenhagen at that time, I did this drawing. And then um, people were very interested because using visual image like this, I think it's a very amazing way to communicate with people. People will remember your message, right? And, and the triangle has changed. And then so there are so many people who are sort of going to uh, international conferences and things, but I would like the people to be more interested on the ground and look at the reality uh, and, and the complexities on these different tropical landscapes. So out of this different work that I did, um, I use a lot of different painting, drawing, videos, films, and all those things, but I, I was able to manage to use all these different passion that I have and working with really doing something um, that could make a change, hopefully, right? Because we, I'm interested in the impact, basically, in what, um, what we do on the ground. So we had a paper working with all these different people from WWF, IUCN, C4, um, Tropenbos, and a lot of, uh, and other people from different organizations in different, different parts of the world and different organizations. So, so um, with uh, Jeff Sayer, who was the first DG of C4, he um, sort of, we, we work a lot on this um, landscape approach, and we also publish papers with different uh, colleagues from different parts of the world on the 10 principles of landscape approach. But again, as I was saying, all these years, it's, it, this is in 2013 or something like that, and then we, we always change our, our ideas and things, right? Because, because the world is changing all the time, and it's very, landscape is very dynamic. So we then decided that we should choose only a few landscapes where we could really engage really deeply and working with partners on the ground. And we use these different uh, concept of sentinel landscapes where we can work and with students, with um, local partners like NGOs, local government, um, part partnership with um, uh, private sector and so on and so forth. And we're, basically we're trying to do mentoring and research and teaching and, and try to build a, a long-term data sets and engage with all these different local um, sort of institutions who work in the landscapes. And it's really a lot of teamwork. So we don't work on our own because I do think multidisciplinary and um, transdisciplinary work is very important to be able to get an impact on our work, basically. So. Uh, you could always uh, look at all these different papers and things um, uh, on the website. And this is from uh, UCN. We 
we, we base a lot of the, um, our work on this uh, learning landscape. So at that time, when I was with IUCN, we work in more than 25 different countries, mostly in the tropics. So that's why I work a lot in the Congo Basin um, in Africa and also in uh, South, Southeast Asia and Central America and South America. Um, there's a lot of different examples and a lot of different publications that were uh, coming out from this different uh, uh, work that we did. So my, my role was at that time was community engagement because uh, uh, I was very interested in when, when Julia was talking about the role of women in all these things, right? And, and I also was interested in all these different role of youth and elders and all these different um, ethnic groups and a lot of different uh, institutions and local um, government institutions, local non-government institutions, and, and again, a lot of different uh, people who are interested in working in all those different places. So basically, we're trying to engage with as many people as possible in those different landscapes where we work. So we are listening, learning, and sharing, and observing everything together. And I take my students to all these different places in very remote places, and I do, I do see that uh, living in those places where there's no electricity, no network, <laughs> no running water, it, it is a really a life-changing experience, but then people will remember. and. People can take better decision in the future. I'm hoping that when they're going to be go back, going back into to their home country or their their landscape where they live and so on and so forth. So basically, it's really learning together and sharing all this knowledge. We were talking about co-generating knowledge, and uh, we're trying to embed science into all these different activities that we do, basically. So um, the first site uh, that I'm going to talk about is in Indonesia. The one in red. So so again, this this concept of sentinel landscape is. Basically, it's because we wanted to be able to compare yeah, the different conditions, because we know that each landscape is different. So culturally, environmentally, politically, and economically, right? So, so I'm just going to give one short, uh, brief uh, uh, example of the one in Kalimantan, which is, uh, uh, you can say, it's the Indonesian part of Borneo. Very culturally diverse. We have more than 700 different languages in Indonesia. And then in Indonesia, we, we are so, uh, so much dependent on natural resources, right? Forests, minerals, agriculture, and marine resources, because Indonesia is an archipelago. And we have a lot of environmental challenges. And we, we are a country where there's a lot of volcano eruption. We have um, uh, earthquakes, and we have tsunamis, and so on and so forth. So it's really such an amazing um, uh, sort of a lab, we could say, right, for our, our work. And it, and it's, uh, the economy in Indonesia is growing really fast, and I think in the next few years, we're, we're at the moment in G20, but people say that we're going to be probably in the G8 or G10 in the next few years in Indonesia, right? So, so we have a lot of impact of climate change, especially with the small islands in the coastal regions, and there's a lot of them very vulnerable to natural disasters there. Yeah. Okay, so um, I passed too fast, but anyway, so one of the sites is the uh, Sea Forest Research Forest, so in the 90s, the, um, the government of Indonesia um, agreed that C4, Center for International Forestry Research, to, to have uh, some area where we could do a lot of work to, working together with the different institutions locally in, from Indonesia, but also international researchers and working with um, communities, with private sector, and a lot of other government institutions. If you could see, um, these are the different ethnic groups that are in that main area. There's more than like seven or eight different ethnic groups, speaks seven, eight different languages. So I worked there about five years for my PhD from late 90s to uh, 98 to 2004. So um, this is, these are two different locations where I, where I go quite regularly for several months during the last four or five years when I was doing my PhD. So the one on the Long Pada, the one farther south, is the, the one really remote area. So to get there is five days of canoeing. And then the other one is uh, sort of the capital of the district. Mm. So uh, this was the theme of C4 at that time, uh, Marino Research Forest. And the things are changing. Uh, even the, the um, government at that time we were part of a district and um, a part of a, a sub-district. And then suddenly it becomes... A district on its own, and then now it becomes a province, um, North Kalimantan province. So if you could probably recognize some of the colleagues from WWF, Tropenbos, IUCN, and, and a lot of different organizations who work together with us, because we like to bring people to the ground, all this remoter area, um, and working together so they do see the complexities in all these different places. Because I do think it's very important to understand um, 
in a multidisciplinary way, the economic value for a social, economical uh, thing, and spiritual, we, we were talking about spiritual part of thing, right? for the, the sacred forest, for example, and, and all this biological biodiversity is very, very rich in Borneo. And I work especially with the Punan communities. Uh, they are the hunter-gatherers communities, and they are now uh, semi-nomadic. So my thesis was to be or not to be a Punan hunter-gatherer. <laughs> so basically, they, they now become more... Um, uh, uh, nomad, uh, this is not, not becoming more sedentary, and they not have also rice cultivation, and then they collect um, gaharu, which is aqualaria, and a lot of other things, or non-timber forest products in the forest. And uh, I also interested in sort of uh, the trade-offs between conservation and development in the area. So, so there, there is a big initiative from WWF on the Haro Borneo, yeah, and then, um, looking at biodiversity conservation and livelihoods of the different Daya communities in this area. So that was an initiative between Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei in the Haro Borneo. So there was a lot of different things, and there was a, also a Borneo biodiversity expedition and a lot of people from, with different backgrounds, different disciplines working together. So I bring my students. So, so as you see, there are some photos from different parts of the year and things like that. So I always come regularly there. With my students, we work still working together in, in partnership. So we work with WWF, with Conservation International, WCS, or even Red Cross in Indonesia sometimes. So, so we bring the students there, and we stay in the villages for two months, three months. And we're looking at also the um, governance challenges, because I'm interested in traditional ecological knowledge, um, traditional governance system, customary laws, taboos, and all those things, because that will help in the sustainability and the conservation of the area, right? So we do need to understand better the culture and the value of all these different things for the local communities, right? Because otherwise, it's, if it's not coming from uh, the communities who live there, behavior will not change, right? So uh, whatever money we put in as conservation organization, we will not be successful. So in 2019, we came back to, the, to that uh, landscape, and we have people coming from Wageningen, from other organizations, um, Norway, uh, Life Sciences University, and all those things, and uh, Australia, and private sector. They, so every year now, we organize a landscape workshop in different sentinel landscapes, and we share um, experiences, and we share uh, what works and what doesn't work, and so on. So, and, and again, I, I'm saying that science is very important. Yeah, we want to have evidence based. So when we say something, we have to have the evidence, and we have to have all these um, data rights and things, because otherwise it, it's not. It's just like a, an anecdote, right? So, so, so um, people are talking a lot about how bad is oil palm and things, but actually, in reality, oil palm itself, the plant is a really good plant, right? It's very efficient, and, and, um, and, and uh, it could give regular income for local communities. I think the bad thing is because when there's corruption or when there's a land grab and things, then it becomes quite bad because we don't want monoculture. But for the local communities themselves, it's not a bad thing because they, they said they could have an oil palm in their agroforest, for example, and then at least then they can have a regular income of $200 a month or whatever, and then they could get... Uh, something from spices like nutmeg or cloves or rubber or coffee. And so mixed crop is very important for local communities. If you ask them about restoration, they will say what well, is actually their priorities instead of having priorities from somebody who's coming from outside of, of the landscape, right? So gaharu, for example, this is aqualaria. You find it a lot also. It's exported everywhere, and they got a lot of money from this. So they started now inoculating it themselves, you know, of gaharu. Usually before, they go into the forest for two, three weeks and cut down the trees. You know, this is actually um, an infection in a tree, and then it smells really nice in the tree, the aqualaria. But now the local communities, this, the punan in the interior, they managed to find uh, some people who, who managed to do the inoculation themselves with the aquilaria. And I, I always like to see, again, from the point of view of these different people on the ground, can it really be compatible with biodiversity conservation? Because there's all these different international organizations and all these UN um, uh, agreements and all those things, but, but whether if the local communities themselves, do they really see that? it could be compatible or not, biodiversity conservation and development. Because the local communities who are still poor and still thinking about what they're going to eat tomorrow, they would like to have incomes, right? They would like to have the economy uh, getting better in their, in their livelihoods. And 
again, the value of all these different things. Like, for example, these are the ladies, uh, the women from the area. They started getting innovative ideas about this is a traditional bag that they do from the rotan. And, and they have so many different traditional motifs and design that are really amazingly rich, right? And, and it, it symbolizes everything. Each, uh, each one has a name and all those things. So it's, it's really symbolized different plants, different animals, and so on. So, so it's very important, I think, to really understand the value of this, the link between the culture and the environment itself, right? And uh, one of the other things that we were recently is about the, the transdisciplinary science. Uh, working together, not just between, uh, with scientists or researchers and things, but transdisciplinary, I mean working with local communities, local NGOs, local government, because then we can make an impact and we could have some behavioral change. And so these are quickly, just about uh, in Congo Basin. Um, this is where uh, I've been going there since 20 years now. <laughs> it's quite fast now, it's already 20 years. And every year we have also a, a landscape workshop with different colleagues. Uh, um, in the, it's along the Sangha River, so it's a, it's a three national de la Sangha. So these are colleagues from WWF, IUCN, CI, uh, companies. As you see, one of them with the background of, the, of the, some, a logging company uh, hosted us because we do want to engage with the private sector because whatever you do, private sector will be making the change in the, in the area, right? Because they're putting money into the area, they give works to uh, jobs to the local economy, and then there's road, and then suddenly if the road is open, then you get schools, and then you get healthcare system or electricity into the area. So uh, this three national Sangha is about 44,000 kilometers square, and there's three national parks because it's between Cameroon, Central African Republic, and uh, Congo, Brazzaville. And there's a lot of this, well, this charismatic species. This is the, probably the only place where you could see forest elephant, not the savanna elephant. This is forest elephant in Central African Republic um, uh, in Bayanga. Well, you can see more than 200 forest elephants in the same place, and you can see gorillas, you can see bongo, you can see a lot of different things. And then, um, yeah, forest, uh, uh, forest gorillas. And I work with the Baka communities, and this is the one thing that I, I want to show you a little bit, is the use of drawing with the local communities. Um, and with, the, with, the, with these drawings, we try to understand what kind of landscape scenarios that they, they would see in the future. So this is the animation that I said. So using their own drawing, we try to see what kind of future they see in the future, whether if they want more agroforest, if they want more wildlife, whether if they want more... Uh, agri um, agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. So this is their own drawing, but then I put it into the computer and I sort of develop a little bit different ways of doing things so that we can sort of try and see scenarios in the landscape. Because visually then people could think better, right? Instead of just their own little village, but they could see a bigger scale what would be impacted in the region and things. So there's a little book that you could download as well from the IUCN website, Visualizing Sustainable Landscapes. Um, and these are the different organizations that were interested. So the good thing is that we don't have any funding for this, but everybody is interested in working together. I think this partnership and engagement and collaboration is always very important because uh, we don't have a lot of budget, but wherever people just come together there and then we just cover basically the meal and the, and the cost to, to, to be there together, right, with all these different companies, organizations, uh, local government and uh, NGOs and so on and so forth. We work with local logging company, and then um, we try to do baseline as well with indicators, with uh, sustainable livelihood framework, with capital assets and so on and so forth, modeling and so on. So there's a lot of different ways of doing things. And uh, there's also mining in the area, right? There's gold mine, there's diamond mine, and these are also multinational company. But we look at all these different um, uh, things with different views from, from the different people who are interested in the landscape. So this is my last slide on what do we, uh, do we think about the landscape? Because we want to have a vibrant forest landscape, yeah? a prosperous landscape, rich people and rich biodiversity. Because at the moment, there's uh, all this rich biodiversity, but people are, uh, a lot of the time, are still poor in this area because it's very remote. So, but it is, understand, uh, uh, it is important to understand complex systems, and there's mm -hmm. multiple visions and priorities yeah, in these landscapes. And we want to have healthy economy because once people uh, are better off, then you could think about conservation, I think, because otherwise, whatever money we put in, we're always not going to be able to do uh, what we want. 
so functional and legal system, I think that's also very important, you know, especially working in those remote areas where sometimes you don't have the resources to get there or, or you don't have all the, the, the government is not even existing there, right? And, and, and um, the local communities, they, they can do a lot of things themselves normally. And there's also the access and the rights to the land. And also there's the issue about, the, yeah, the civil society need to be empowered in all those things, I think. And, and we keep on nudging, basically, and we have to be able to learn together from each other, I think. And, and uh, I, the last point is that I think SDG might be able to be one of the way to sort of have indicators, right, and to see whether if a landscape is doing better or not than others. And uh, because I think the SDG is, uh, gives a little bit of um, uh, an idea of what how, and how things could be in the, in the future. So that's it, and um, this is just a, a mural painting, uh, because one of the ways that we do is using participatory mural painting. So uh, tonight, I think from six to eight, we will be trying to do a mural painting together out there. So hopefully uh, a lot of you will be able to participate. And I think this is a good way as well during international conferences to do uh, painting together, because then that's when people get together, whether if you're from an indigenous community group or whether if you're from a company or local government, then we could paint together and how do you see the future together using art basically thank you thank you wonderful thank you so much so are there any questions in the audience from um up for dr bordi hartano and then when if we have specific questions for this um, presentation we'll do that now and then we'll open it up for a general discussion any questions? And I'll look online and see. Over there. Over there. Did someone? Yeah. Yeah. If you want to give her the microphone. Hi. Yeah. Oh, she's got yeah. It. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this really interesting panel. Um, I listened to the last two speakers. I was listening online and then was coming on the way here. Um, so my name is Hui Ying. I'm a visiting student from the Rachel Carson Center, um, a PhD student, and I'm, I'm, I have a background in anthropology and uh, geography. And I have a question that relates to the, the point about commercialization of uh, forest products, um, or even thinking about the way a new bioeconomy is going to come into the picture, alongside the very last presentation where Agni so elegantly sketched out how many different collaborators want to work together and are working together, even without um, securing funding in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if the panel can say something about this relationship between this assumption that we need to have a secure source of funding before some collaborations can take shape, mm -hmm. and how, what that means in terms of the different kinds of economy we can look towards. Who would like yeah. to tackle that? <laughs> I could start maybe, yeah, yeah. yeah because uh, in the landscape where we work, uh, most of the time, uh, the things that work were, we didn't really have a lot of uh, funding, or it's not a project, right? And, and, and then so we just said, to, basically we have a, a little bit of funding just to get to gather people together. And we were sort of saying, okay, so if you're interested, uh, we can host you or we could have things. Because I'm afraid uh, all these different projects, usually they have a three years program or or five years from then in a short time, and then, and then after that, there's no more funding, and then everything falls apart, right? And so, so far, what we, we see that it works well is when we, we sort of said, even in the TNS, it's very remote, right? It's very costly to get there, but then people really keen to share, and they, they really, really want to be able to learn from each other, and then, then it works. And, and in Mali now, it's the same, and up to now, we, we have people coming from she different can. parts of even from other parts of the world, and uh, people who used to work there with people, even though now they're not with people anymore, they're going to fight and funding that. I guess we, we need to talk about uh, when there's local interest or when there's a local champion, then we should support them. Instead of with coming with ideas from outside and then trying to So I am sure that when we have some exp initiative that must be with people, local people, it's very important. You can start with an NGO or 
that is in the region as well. But to get this uh, self-sustainable, the, the business, the cooperative, the association must be in that, in that place. So I think that is, this is crucial. But what, as a funder, what I, I look for is initiatives that can the have the potential to, mm. uh, to go through over the project, after the project finished uh, ends. And because of that, we are looking for to strengthen this business case, to, to find out this business case. Sometimes they don't have a business case, most of times. But it depends. If I am talking about uh, economy in a land, in indigenous land, it's, it's quite different. Uh, they don't have this notion of business case. And uh, indigenous woman was talking to me. It's completely different, this notion for us of prof profit, profit and enfin, uh, uh, enfin. So mm -hmm. things that uh, we, for us, is quite simple. So what I would like to, what I normally look in these projects is the potential to become a better business to them, not for me. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Fisher? No, I have nothing to add yeah. to my yeah. expert colleagues here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I don't know. Uh, Andrea? Sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just to start to your comments. Yeah. I think it's, it's really, really uh, right to talk about uh, difference of perspective than difference of notions. Mm -hmm. I think indigenous people, they have their own perspective about the business case. Mm -hmm. And uh, oftentimes on the ground, they always say, you know, technicians, uh, they, f they always find problems where, where we find solutions. Mm -hmm. So the other thing I want to say in, with, in relation to resource mobilization, I think what we need from the local people is not only the technical adoption of whatever we bring as in, but also the financial adoption. As, a, as practitioners, we rarely really think about exit strategy from the earlier stage of the I think if we think about the exit strategy in the earlier stage of the project, we start building the capacity for things to happen after. And Yeah, I completely agree with you. We, this capacity building, but from from their knowledge is very important. Sometimes we can offer. Uh, we, for example, in the fund, we do not uh, implement ourselves. We always uh, work with partnerships, with partners that already are in the territory. They have the trust of uh, a lot of communities and. Most of the time, we are working directly with the associations and trying to build something together. We never can impose our view of things. So it's, uh, I completely agree with you. And my background is always working in civil society. So we learn this and we have a very horizontal, horizontal? Horizontal, horizontal way of uh, dealing with this. So you are right. We have a question um, from the online audience that's very much along this line. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to, to share that with you. And mm -hmm. I think everyone in the panel could, could maybe answer. Um, the question is, do you think that indigenous knowledge and practices can be promoted or supported instead of being displaced and replaced by yeah. modern te technology innovations? Can they go together? Yeah. Big question. <laughs> yeah. So, so for me, yes, of course, because I'm interested in all this traditional ecological knowledge and, and all the um, traditional 
uh, how do you say, um, way of doing things, wise practices. But again, uh, the world is changing, right? And, and the number of population is growing as well. So even the elders themselves, when I talk to them, they realize how things are changing. Landscape is dynamic and it's not staying the same. As they said, our culture is not the same anymore, they said. Our culture will adapt to the changes, they said. So they do realize that there are changes. And even in British Columbia at the moment with the First Nation elders, they were saying, we have to look at which one of our traditional um, customs that we will keep, they said to me. Mm -hmm. And then, I, because I, I, I work with forest dependent communities with the Baka and Baka Pygmies in the Congo Basin and with the Punan hunter gatherers group with the Huawulu in Malukus and it's the same they said uh, the world is changing because before we were like I don't know uh, 5,000 people but now we are 8,000 and our land is still the same or even less right because it's been taken by other people and so on and so forth so so they know things are changing so as they said our traditional knowledge it might not be appropriate anymore here but it might be appropriate in other ways so it all depends again and as I said, the younger generation might have different priorities and they might have different wants, they said. And of course, right? And, and it's, it's a human nature, so. Yeah. Mm. Would you like to? Sure. Um, I, I agree with Intu. The world is changing. And forgive me for um, this maybe blanket optimism or maybe even naivete. But um, I, I really do think we're listening better now. Mm -hmm. I think the integration of traditional ecological knowledge mm -hmm. in just in scientific grants and mm -hmm. making sure that you have local voices and local knowledge being brought yeah. into the scientific approach, mm -hmm. just that as, a, as an indicator mm -hmm. um, of that these two worlds potentially, like the more tech and the rapidly changing world and the knowledge mm -hmm. that has been built up over thousands, sometimes 10,000 years, um, are being more integrated now than they ever have been. And so my department alone at the University of Vermont, we have a whole bunch of um, tenure track faculty hires and one of them is in traditional ecological knowledge where mm. 10 years ago we would have not made that hire. Yeah. Um, and then I also think I teach a class and I make the students read braiding sweetgrass and even our like mm -hmm. furthest quantitative scientific mm -hmm. students are starting to be like, wow, actually that's really amazing how she yeah. integrated traditional ecological knowledge with her botany and her genetic skills. So anyway, I think the world is changing and I think we're, yeah. we're listening better now than we have in a long time. And I think I can add one other point is that when I was in Australia and now in Canada, even the Canadian Research Council, they acknowledge that there are different ways of transferring knowledge, right? All this co-generating knowledge. So I just got a new grant now, it's called New Frontier. It's the use of art as a boundary tool, mm -hmm. which before people wouldn't accept that, right? And, and, and so they, they, they accept the idea that I use art, painting, music, theater, and different cultural diversity ways of, for conservation, basically. And uh, we, we, we just started this as well to look at how do people actually use art in uh, yeah, connecting people mm -hmm. with diverse uh, discipline and diverse vision and all those things. So I, I'm glad because that means that the research councils in, in Australia and Canada were quite open to the ideas. You know, mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Great. Is there another uh, question? Yes, back there. Okay, uh, good question. <laughs> I'd like to know also. <laughs> uh, I think, first of all, I think that the, the capex to implement, for example, agroforests, it's, it's still very expensive. And the, besides, although the, the tax of return 
is, is high, in the paper is high. Uh, the, the, it takes a long time to return. So the, the studies that we are seeing and doing, it takes around nine, nine years to have your uh, investment back. So this kind of thing, plus a lack of technical assistance that really know to do how to handle with this such variety of species, and also what I've said before, uh, the market to all these products, I think that our bottlenecks that still are on the table to, to, to be overcome. So it's not one thing. And, but we have some groups, for example, private groups that are already thinking about investing in, in the Amazon doing big agroforestry. Agro the question is, how to be inclusive? How to include people, smallholders, and people that need to recover degraded areas? This, is this is a good point to think. So for example, projects of carbon or red. I even didn't say something about this here because it's so complicated. Right now, we have a lot of we have a mess in Brazil regarding this issue and the protect areas with uh, traditional people. With uh, amazing, incredible uh, asymmetry of information between the parts. Um, between the parts. So uh, this is mm. another thing. We have all the, the things to, to have this market. Mm. But if you go to the to the private, to private, to voluntary market, we only see big farmers with big properties, properties around 200,000 uh, hectares or more, having this, going in this kind of uh, market. Mm -hmm. What to do for, and I think, I really think that it's a window of opportunity. Because did you see the indigenous land, how it is securing deforestation? They should receive something in terms of environmental service payment. But this is still very difficult to see how this market will, uh, if will, um, benefit this, this, this kind of protecting people, uh, areas and, and, and forest peoples. Wonderful. We just have a few more minutes left, and I just wanted to maybe bring up a, a theme that we've seen in the other sessions. Uh, that and, and get all of your perspectives on it, um, especially from this sort of social science and, and you know, perspective of, of people and, and forests. So something that's come up in the other, other sessions is related to scale, which is really what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, we hear about the importance of um, contextualizing our, mm -hmm. our, our efforts and the importance of you know the sentinel landscapes and really mm -hmm. focusing on areas where we can understand mm -hmm. relationships and culture and history, mm -hmm. power dynamics and so forth. Yet on the other hand, we think about and talk about this concept of scaling mm -hmm. um, and having these big impacts, and uh, it, it just seems like a contradiction in certain ways. And so I'm wondering, in your experiences, and I know we have just mm -hmm. a minute left, but if do you have any sort of parting thoughts and words of wisdom from your experiences, from, you know, there are no answers really out there right now, but, <laughs> or ever, but it's an evolving process, and I, I'm just really curious to hear from each of you what your thoughts are on scale versus contextualizing and complexity at the local level. Dr. Fisher, let's start oh, with you. sure. Um, <laughs> Easy I, question. I'm trying to think of an example of some kind of social contagion, but I just... <laughs> Oh, I think you just left, but June's um, talk last night about um, the, the agroforester who brought people to his, his land, and that's like a game changer, and I would say that would be an answer to the agroforestry tech thing, is these pilot projects um, 
uh, when people can see things working and feel the forest and look at it, then you can all of a sudden nowadays, because in 10 minutes it could be to a million, two million, I don't even know, 20 million users of TikTok or whatever, you can see these things. I think scaling is easier now than, than yeah. it might have ever been because... Um, but starting at this project yeah. size might still be the key, these demonstrations of how things can work. Yeah, mm. yeah. Yeah, I, I agree that it's a, well, for us, it's like a, this landscape retreat that we do every year, and we're trying to always still be close on the ground, but at the same time, we invite people from other parts of the world and sharing together again with their experience, whether if it's success stories or failures and things. I think it's important for people to understand that they, uh, the different uh, success and failures in the, in the different landscape. And again, like uh, uh, we, we say, uh, yeah, now with social media and things, people can, can learn. Even the farmers, uh, they contacted me. I mean, I don't know, Geneva or Vancouver or Australia with Facebook, for mm -hmm. example, right? And they can get prices mm -hmm. of, of uh, I don't know, their products and, and things like that from their Facebook or WhatsApp and things like that. So. I guess uh, in terms of yeah scale, it's it's very important. I guess uh, to understand the differences between uh, village level or district level or national level, because the policies will be completely different from one island to the other, mm -hmm. right? In Indonesia, or in Cameroon, or anywhere else. So yeah, yeah. And the time, I think the the, the time scale as well is important to mm -hmm. understand, right? Mm -hmm. The historical timeline and all those things that we do, and just really understanding the changes in the landscape and things like that. Yeah. The final word. Okay, uh, <laughs> scale versus no scale. <laughs> I think this a lot. It's it's this question used to struggle me, uh, but now I think that there are no um, an opposite between scale and local initiatives. Both can can be in the same place. Mm -hmm. It depends on the perspective, on the place and the, the region. So we can have to change, for example, to change arc of deforestation to an arc of arc of deforestation to a new arc of restoration. We need private mm. sector, we need indigenous people, we need everyone. So it's not a only sector or only government. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that things are not are not a, a contradiction mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and, for example, to have access to the internet, this is a, this is a struggle mm -hmm. because, for example, in Amazon region, in Brazilian Amazon region, we have one community from the four more than four thousand that have that has fast internet. Mm -hmm. We can imagine us without internet nowadays. So having fast internet is, could be dangerous, someone could say. But it's very important to access education, health, and to boost the business, to have access, access, to, the, access to markets. And so it's, I think that there are uh, some structural things that mm -hmm. we need to think before thinking about scale or uh, we need to connect a lot of people. Of course, we have to have uh, safeguards, but mm -hmm. we need uh, a lot of things first, structural things. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I, I really, I am really excited about this uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. I, I thank you very much and mm -hmm. I hope that we can have more applied science coming from this amazing group and the practitioner 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 yes practitioner as well <laughs> and i hope that that you understand my poor english yeah it's fantastic <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. And, and we'll have lots of opportunity to talk in the rest of the, the conference and tonight. 
several hours of socializing, so that sounds wonderful. And before we leave, I do want to give a huge thank you to those student organizers. Yeah. Um, I know Liza said this morning in the session that they're doing all this in addition to their regular classwork, <laughs> and they're just doing a fantastic mm -hmm. job, and this wouldn't be here and happening without them. And I see mm -hmm. past organizers here, alumni and, and so <laughs> forth, who've done this in the past. So thank you all so much, thank and thank you again. Thanks, thank we really you. appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.